We are going to start our afternoon section. And the first speaker of the, in the afternoon is the most uh, famous Professor Zhang. The Dr. Shouchen Zhang is the founding chairman of DHVC as well as the J.G. Jackson and Shizhe Wood Professor of Physics. He is the member of U.S. National Amer Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a foreign member of Chinese Academy of Sciences. He discovered a new state of matter called topology of uh, insulator, in which electrons can conduct along the edge without dissipation. For this groundbreaking work, he received numerous uh, prestigious awards, including the Benjamin Franklin Medal, the previous uh, um, the winner, including Albert Einstein, Madden Curie, and Stephen Hawking. Yeah, let's welcome Dr. Shouchen Zhang. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I uh, uh, feel glad to come here and to share with you my thoughts. Uh, as you heard from my uh, from the introduction, uh, I'm a physics uh, professor at uh, Stanford University. Uh, but I also got very, very interested uh, in blockchain and uh, crypto economics. Uh, I will try to explain the reason why. Because the one thing we have in common between theoretical physics and blockchain is that it all builds on a solid mathematical foundation. Uh, especially in today's uh, atmosphere, where we see the extreme uh, bear market in the crypto space, a lot of people start losing face. Uh, but I think it's especially at those kind of moments that we have to think about what are the fundamental intrinsic values of the blockchain. And that's the main ideas I like to share uh, with you. So uh, like uh, many things, uh, blockchain is a little bit elusive, right? It's basically a protocol. And a lot of people talk about uh, uh, blockchain or internet as a kind of a medium of exchange. And uh, so there's a, a quite a profound way to understand the role of the medium of uh, exchange. And I'd like to explain this by some uh, analogies. So early days, as you know, in human uh, societies, uh, we have barter economy, uh, so we have a fish uh, to exchange with your rice or with your uh, uh, corn, uh, corns. Uh, so uh, this kind of barter economy is uh, very inefficient. It's quite obvious, but it's rather inefficient uh, because it requires uh, the probability for such exchange to occur is very low because it requires what is called a double coincidence of wants. Because in, lo in order for this exchange to happen, I have to happen to want your rice, and you have to happen to want my fish. And this is not necessarily the case. So to have a double coincidence of wants uh, is much lower probability, and uh, that's why this economy is inefficient. So later, people move to a monetary economy, money as a medium of exchange. So people exchange goods to, into money, and then money into uh, other goods. So this is a much uh, more efficient form of uh, exchange. But we always wondered, as I hold a piece of paper in my hand, uh, why does this piece of paper called money has some intrinsic value? And this is the main uh, question I'd like to address with you uh, today. So I'd like to address this by making an analogy. In the early days, when you try to describe electrical phenomena, uh, we know there are electrical charges, and the light charges repel, and unlike charges uh, attract uh, each other. So early days, we just uh, described this kind of interaction uh, just by the pairwise interaction uh, between the charges. So in that sense, it's uh, very uh, analogous to the barter economy. You have to talk about one charge directly interacting with uh, another charge. But later, people introduce a concept uh, of a medium of exchange for electrical charge, and that's called electrical field. So we don't say charge one directly acts a force on charge two, but charge one generates an electrical field, and that electrical field further acts on the second charge. So, this is the, so there the concept of the medium of exchange is born, the concept of electrical field or electromagnetic field. But then the similar question you can ask, whether this is just a auxiliary concept, auxiliary device, or does it have some intrinsic meaning or intrinsic value by itself? Does electrical field has an intrinsic value of its own? Just like we ask whether money has intrinsic value of its own. 
actually, this question was answered by the great, uh, maybe the one of the greatest uh, scientists of all time, Albert Einstein. Uh, you perhaps know that uh, Einstein uh, did special and general theory of relativity, but he didn't win Nobel Prize for either of these uh, great works. He actually won Nobel Prize for something called electrical field, uh, a photoelectric effect, and which is precisely a way to assign an intrinsic value to the medium of exchange. Uh, so, for example, uh, we know light is electromagnetic field, and they have different energies, and blue light has higher energy than the green light, which has higher energy than the red light. And that is all cast by Einstein's uh, formula, uh, E of the photon is equal to H, the Planck constant, times the frequency. So this is a very interesting uh, evolution in the conceptual development of natural science, that in the beginning, uh, the medium of exchange was introduced as an auxiliary uh, uh, description, uh, which seems to be uh, something uh, we don't quite know whether it has some intrinsic value. But the value in the physical world is energy, and then Einstein's greatest contribution is to assign an intrinsic value to the medium of exchange. So therefore, we can ask the similar question today. What is the value, intrinsic value for money as a medium of exchange? And if I have two uh, candidates uh, for uh, money uh, as a medium of exchange, how do we assess which one could be better? So let's, for example, compare uh, the case of Apple. Uh, Apple can also be used as a medium of exchange. Uh, you perhaps know today, even today, uh, in, the, in the prison system, uh, people uh, use uh, cigarettes as a medium of exchange. So you can use goods as a medium of exchange. And let's, say, uh, for the sake of argument, take Apple as a proposal for a medium of exchange. And contrast that with gold. Uh, as a medium of exchange. So, for example, we can convert something into one apple or several apple, or convert something into uh, several ounces of gold. So now I would like to argue that uh, despite the commodity value of apple and uh, gold, the intrinsic monetary value can be assessed by asking the question whether by the concept of one apple, uh, different people have totally different uh, value assigned to it, uh, or uh, let's say we have one ounce, uh, many people, uh, all different people assign the same value to it. So basically when we talk about if you give me uh, some amount of rice, I give you one apple, different people understand one apple very, very differently. It can be a good apple, it can be a red apple, it can be a ripe apple, it can be a rotten apple, and so on. So there's a very broad distribution of what is meant by one unit of apple. But when we say one ounce of gold, it's very, very sharply understood. There's no ambiguity. So therefore, I argue the intrinsic value of money lies in its consensus, how sharply uh, the distribution is. If we say one ounce of gold, never mind the commodity value of one ounce of gold, uh, we all understand one ounce of gold uh, very, very precisely. There's no ambiguity. Now, the reason there's no ambiguity and the reason why there's high consensus about gold is, again, due to the work of two great physicists. One by Archimedes. You perhaps know the story that Archimedes was tasked with a question by the king. To uh, the king, uh, somebody fashioned a beautiful uh, golden uh, crown uh, for the king. Uh, it's supposed to be made of the pure gold, but the king was very suspicious whether it's actually made of pure gold. And he asked uh, Archimedes to figure that out without breaking the crown. How can you do that? So Archimedes, even though he was the brightest scientist of his time, was still very, very perplexed by this task. And in the last day, when he was supposed to submit the answer to the king, he was totally desperate, and he took a bath. And as he was floating inside the bathtub, he suddenly had an idea. And uh, <clears throat> so basically, he knew. Uh, and he, the story goes that he jumped out of the bathtub naked, ran into the king's court, uh, and he shouted on the way, Eureka, Eureka, I discovered it. So basically, the solution is very simple. You take a scale. On the left-hand side, you put the uh, crown. And on the right side, you put pure gold, exact amount that it balances exactly uh, the crown in vacuum, in air. But then you put the same scale into the water and the scale will tip if the uh, crown is not made out of pure gold. So this way he figured out 
uh, whether the crown, without breaking it, is actually made out of pure gold or not. So therefore, by general Archimedes method, we can assess very, very precisely whether somebody claimed that they have one ounce of gold, whether it's exactly made out of one ounce of gold or not. Later, people get a little bit lazy. They fashion some golden coins, and people pass the golden coins uh, from one to the other without performing the Archimedes uh, experiment to measure. Uh, and people start to cheat. Uh, once you have a golden coin, uh, you can uh, chip away a little bit on the edge. And if you chip enough of them, uh, after maybe 100 of them, uh, you get an extra golden coin. So then suddenly, by one golden coin, we don't know exactly what we mean. It's like we have a very broad distribution, right? Because if I say I give you one golden coin, it could be a golden coin that has been chipped away a little bit, or it can be still a pure golden coin. So again, it leads to a broad distribution of consensus rather than a sharp distribution of consensus. So Newton's contribution, after he became a famous scientist, the Queen of England uh, gave him a good job, uh, a very uh, high paying job. He became the master of the royal mint. And he tries to solve this problem that uh, uh, criminals uh, try to cheat and try to chip away something from the golden coin. And he introduced the idea that he puts these uh, edges, uh, uh, puts these stripes on the edges of the coin so that you immediately notice when somebody uh, chips something away from it. So therefore, then, we, by one, one golden coin, we understand, again, very precisely what is one golden coin. So again, uh, by Newton's method, a very broad distribution suddenly becomes very, very sharp. So that's, for, that's why in order for transactions to happen in our economy, we have to have very sharp consensus about the medium of exchange. And that is the key value which I'm proposing. So now how can the physical world somehow reach some consensus? Actually, there is a way in a distributed fashion uh, that the physical world can reach consensus. So uh, actually, every material is made out of electron. Every electron is like a little magnetic compass. Then why are not most materials magnetic? And that's because most of the time, they don't reach consensus about which direction to point to. And they're pointing to all random directions. And then there's no consensus and no overall magnetization. On the left, uh, or in the middle, uh, you see actually a particular state, which we call magnetic state, where they all reach consensus about the overall direction. And suddenly, uh, it acts like a magnet. You can put this magnet on your refrigerator, and it will not fall down, because uh, it is uh, a, a reached a consensus state, which is magnetic. So this actually tells you, because all in the previous uh, human history, or we always thought that consensus has to be humanly imposed. Uh, either by a king or by a central bank or some kind of a centralized human entity. But actually, we see the examples in the physical world. They can actually reach consensus uh, without a central uh, conscious uh, entity. And this is possible. But this is possible at a cost. Uh, we know that the physical world left on its own always tends to be more and more disordered. Uh, but uh, in, uh, but they're under special circumstances, they can actually reach agreement and become more, more ordered. But the price you have to pay is that you have to make the rest of the world more disordered. And that's, it, it is called the second law of thermodynamics. So this is actually the fundamental idea behind a proof of work concept in blockchain. So in order for a distributed ledger uh, to be functional in a purely decentralized distributed fashion, we somehow have to reach consensus. Reach consensus about what? Namely, about the timing of the transaction. So if we have a distributed ledger, it's very, very important to keep which transaction happens uh, which other transaction. If you don't keep track of that, then uh, the ledger will not function because you can then start double spend. So somehow we have to reach consensus about the uh, timing of the transactions, uh, but this is very hard to reach. And the solution is trying to everybody, ask everybody try to solve a mathematical puzzle, which is a hash function. And if uh, and this uh, function has the property, this mathematical puzzle has the property that it's very difficult to solve, but very easy to verify. So whoever first solves the puzzle will have the right or the vote to say which transaction be uh, happened be before which transaction. And therefore, the system works. So you see, this is a wonderful example of my idea, that uh, you reach consensus, which is uh, what we call a low entropy state, a consensus state, but it's at a cost 
that we have to burn some extra energy in solving the hash puzzle in order to win the vote. So this uh, really to uh, physicists really sounds like an ideal design that uh, we know that the ordered state is possible, but it has to happen at a cost in making the rest of the world more disordered. In this case, the disorder is created by burning electricity into heat in the process of solving the hash puzzle. So therefore, this finally gives us a way to exchange value over a decentralized distributed uh, uh, network and still by uh, exchanging value by reaching uh, consensus. So I characterize the history of the world and the history of the technological uh, networking world with uh, eight Chinese characters, Fen Jiu Bi He He Jiu Bi Fen, centralization versus decentralization. In the early days, AT&T was a centralized monopoly, and that monopoly was uh, possible because the technology of the time, circuit switching, favors a monopolistic operation. But later, a decentralized protocol gets invented, which is TCPIP, and that immediately, overnight, destroyed the monopoly of at and But then, the content gets spread very widely over the internet and becomes disorganized. And then centralized entity emerge, such as Google and Facebook, and they manage this content and organize this content, and they created a tremendous value for themselves in the process. So the question I'd like to ask is, are these giants of today, Google and Facebook, similar to at and of the past? Whether there will be a new era in which their monopoly gets uh, de destroyed and some new entity uh, will uh, emerge in the process of Fen Jiu Bi He. So I believe blockchain is such a technology. Yeah, and, and internet is only a, a communication network, peer-to-peer -peer distributed communication network, but blockchain is a value exchange. Value, you can only exchange value by reaching consensus, but this is the wonderful mechanism of reaching consensus. Therefore, it makes value exchange possible. So this is a wonderful world. I really feel happy for the humanity that finally will reach uh, such a state. Because we talk about consensus, let me ask all of you a very simple question. About all branches of human knowledge, about which branch do we have the most consensus about? It's certainly not economics. It's certainly not social science. It is not psychology. It's not even biology, uh, chemistry, or physics. At the deepest level, among all branches of human knowledge, we have most consensus about mathematics. A mathematical formula is just true. No argument about that. So we actually use math to explain the deepest laws of the physical world. And finally, we're embracing a new era in which we, in math, we trust. We build a social relationship of trust based on math. What kind of math? Uh, these are things like uh, public and private key uh, encryption based on elliptic curves, uh, cryptographic hash functions, zero knowledge proof, secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, uh, formal verification, and so on and so forth. What can this kind of math do? Just like Google is an organization of the world's public information, this kind of math will enable an uh, organization of the world's private information. So uh, this uh, brings me to the symbiosis between blockchain and AI. So AI, what AI needs the most, besides high computational power, besides high uh, good uh, AI deep learning algorithm, it needs a lot of data. But at some point, we're getting to a, a situation that we need private data to learn, not just any uh, public data. And that becomes very, very hard. But with the blockchain incentive value system plus this mathematics of privacy-preserving computation, finally we can make massive amounts of data possible for AI to learn. So what kind of thing we can enable? So now let me make a, a remark that this is uh, all the previous thoughts are very general. This one is very specific. It's a company I just founded called uh, Novo Vivo. So after investing in the blockchain space and AI space for a long time, I came to the realization that there's a need for such a company to organize the world's private information rather than Google organizing the world's uh, public information. Because healthcare data, biomedical data are very, very private to individual, but with the blockchain, you can enable individual ownership of your, all your biomedical and your health data. And you can imagine that all my biomedical and health data is stored on the cloud, but in the encrypted form. With two keys, with my private key, I completely lock and encrypt all my data, and with the public key, 
uh, it's tied to my wallet address, and anybody who can compute using this kind of mathematics on my encrypted data and learning some AI wisdom out of it, they will have to pay into my public address wallet. And with this uh, encrypted calculation, it becomes possible that even though the data privacy is completely maintained, you can still learn collective wisdom, for example, using the biomedical data uh, to discover a new drug. So this is the interesting example. I like to, uh, I think a lot of people are still very, very confused. What are the useful applications of the blockchain? I claim this will be a killer app of the blockchain. Uh, so basically, uh, it also enables uh, this uh, crypto economic behavior to do tremendous social good. So what are the social injustices we face today? Most, almost all, by definition, social injustice is related to the mistreatment of minorities. But in this world, if we're using AI and machine learning to learn from data, Imagine me, my AI algorithm is already 90% accurate, and I want to go from 90% accuracy to 99% of accuracy. What kind of data do I need? Certainly, I don't need yet another kind of data, which is the majority data, because I already learned it in the rest of the 90%. What I need the most is the minority data, uh, what are the corner cases, which can help to improve my, my AI algorithm from 90% to 99%. So that's why in such a data marketplace, people will bid much higher for the data owned by the minority than the data owned by the majority. So this becomes a counterbalancing force to act for social good. So I call this new scenario, a beautiful uh, uh, ugly duckling become a beautiful swan. The ugly duckling is not ugly, simply different. But in this new world, the ugly duckling will become a beautiful swan. So let me very briefly tell you about the fund, uh, DHVC. So, um, the very, uh, so it was founded uh, about three, four years ago. It's based on the principle that uh, we should invest by understanding the first principles of investment. And uh, you perhaps saw the logic of my presentation today is really to think about this crypto uh, space, this blockchain space, from fundamental first principles. You can only have confidence to invest when you understand the first principle. So we try also to build a bridge between the latest frontier research uh, in academia with the uh, actual uh, application uh, world. So uh, besides the incubation product, uh, project I just mentioned to you called Novo Vivo, uh, we're also uh, very uh, interested in the blockchain scaling solution. So I think the future of the world for the monetary uh, system will develop in somewhat of an analogous in the crypto world, somewhat analogous to the real world. In the real world, we have different levels of currency, such as M0, M1, M2, and so on. So people have some complaint that the blockchain is a little bit slow. Uh, it only can do two transactions per second. But think about gold. The transaction based on gold is even uh, slower. So I think blockchain is basically the counterpart of gold. I have a deepest conviction that sooner or later blockchain, uh, Bitcoin will completely replace gold. Gold has a market cap of about 10 trillion. Right now, Bitcoin only has a market cap of 200 billion. That is inevitable uh, because uh, Bitcoin is much uh, better uh, store of value, but also enables transaction, which is much, much faster uh, uh, compared to gold. But anchored on this physical objective consensus mechanism, namely consensus based on math, based on hash functions, uh, this is a very, very solid foundation. And in that sense, it's similar to gold. Gold is objective, it's not biased, not controlled by any government. And uh, so is uh, Bitcoin. But then based on anchored on the Bitcoin M0 or M1, you can build higher level currencies, uh, derivatives on top of it, and which can transact much faster. So this is the, what I envision the future of the world will be. Uh, a very exciting direction is also tokenization of the network infrastructure. By sharing network resources, people can get incentivized through token. I already told you about this idea of Novo Vivo, and stable token is certainly necessary for transaction to happen, and uh, tokenization of the sharing economy, and also the identity management. So DHVC invested in a very promising company, a blockchain project called Ontology. It is one of the most successful blockchain uh, projects in history. 
So uh, I uh, come to the conclusion of my talk. Basically, uh, hu humanity made a giant leap forward with Newton's book of Mathematical Principle of Natural Philosophy. For the very first time, mathematics gets applied to the natural world. But now we're embracing a new era in math we trust, where math becomes the fundamental fabric of our social behavior. And that is what's so exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, please stay for okay. a second. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang. And then we will have a word, uh, the outstanding investor of the year for uh, Dr. Zhang. Thank you. Thank you very much.